Good morning, church, and everybody joining us on the live stream this morning. Why don't we stand as we worship our Lord? worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. And see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Good morning, Church on the Hill, Church on the Lawn, those of you watching online, it's good to have you. It's September. Look around you. Does it feel like September? Isn't it nice? That song we sang, um, you've done great things. Uh, I think you listen around us today and there's this clamor to do something. Come on, politicians, you need to do something. Uh, Government, you need to do something. Somebody needs to do something. 
I want to say to you this morning as we get started here in worship that the God of the universe has done something. 2,000 years ago, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John said, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And when the government or religious leaders wanted Him to do something, show us a sign, come on. He chose to do something that shifted the course of history, and that was um, to allow Himself to be sold into the hands of an angry mob thinking they were going to do something to him when he in fact undid something that had been done before that which was the salvation of mankind the buying back of his creation this morning we're gonna we're gonna do something in response to what he did our we can't add to that we can't add to what god has done all we can do is stop and thank him and worship i want to encourage you this morning in the next few minutes as we as we worship here together and online that Think about that. God has done something. Our job now is not to add to that. Our job is not to ignore that. Our job is to just enter into that. So, Father, this morning we just say, you have done great things. That refrain in our head, you have done great things. You saved us. You rescued us. You stuck with us. You persevered. You hounded us. You redeemed us. You healed us. You have done great things. As we begin this morning, would you do this with me, a little exercise? Would you just stop? I know you have things on your mind, and I know the phone is probably buzzing in your pocket, but would you just stop for a moment? I'd like you to call to mind somewhere in the past in your life where God has come and done something for you, somewhere where God has done something in you, Come on, just everybody here right now, just in your mind, Lord, I want to just look back. Where would I be if you hadn't done something in my life, if you hadn't done something in my body, my marriage, my heart? Got something online here, live here? What has God done in your life that he's worthy of just our words here this morning and our song, our heart going up before him? You have done great things, and we celebrate that this morning. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope and without love. mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin king the world from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Yeah. 
All of heaven held its breath Till that stone was moved for good And the Lamb had conquered death By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who is resurrected me Amen! Do you believe that this morning, church? And praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the that this morning that our God is great. 
If you do, let's praise him together this morning. He is worthy of our praise, amen. All the earth will shout his praise. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will shake. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will
you hear what the, uh, the songwriter is calling us to this morning? To something unshakable, to something unchanging. Can we make that agreement today? Not just with the... Sometimes it's, it's easy to fall into a song, and we've heard it before, we've sang it before, but let's consciously just take our, our whole heart there this morning, our soul there. Say, Father, we... Uh, in a time of great change, in a time of turmoil, in a time where the wind changes direction with every new cycle, and our emotions want to follow it, we say no. We go to the rock of our salvation, to the stone that the builders rejected. We go to the mountain, and the mountain stands by us. We say, you are our God, and we will stay here. We will stay here on your solid rock. Wave to somebody next to you as you sit down. Hey, neighbor, welcome to the lawn. We are glad that you're with us. Um, several of you have asked how long are we going to continue to meet outside, and the answer is as long as the uh, weather permits us to. It's a beautiful day today. It's supposed to be nice next week. Oh, we got a little dancer down Run away. Front. We got to hey. run away. Hey there. We got a runner. <laughs> Um, it's they great to have the, for a have the kids outside. It's great to be in our lawn chairs, mm -hmm. and uh, it's great to gather. Um, we're fortunate to be able to do it with you, and we're glad to be able to do it with you. All summer long, we've been in a series, if you're visiting, on the book of Psalms. Uh, the book of Psalms is right about smack in the middle of your Bible, uh, chronologically anyway, or uh, um, division-wise. But it's, uh, it's a book that covers a wide range of human experience and human emotion, I think we're in week 11 or 12, and we've covered everything from disappointment to uh, anger to, uh, to confession to trust to all kinds of things. And today, we're talking about gratefulness. We're going to be in Psalm 107. If you're visiting, the psalm is written inside. The words to this psalm are written inside your blue packet, mm -hmm. and uh, you can read along if you don't have a device or a Bible to read along with us. But um, inside that blue packet is what we'll be covering this morning. A heart of gratitude, that's our sermon title this morning, a heart of gratitude. It's a great question to ask yourself. Do I walk with a grateful heart? Do I, do I recognize what's been given to me? Do I say thank you for it at that just most basic level? Am I, am I someone who recognizes the good that's been done for me? And, and do I respond in kind? Do I respond with gratitude and thanks to the people who have, who have blessed me, to the God who has made me? You think about the, how critical something like this is because... A grateful heart is a, um, is a healthy heart. Uh, the Bible, there's more than we could ever possibly cover on a Sunday morning, but the Bible is full of this idea of gratefulness, of thankfulness. We're not talking now about a, uh, an American holiday called Thanksgiving. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about an attitude of heart, an attitude that says, <clears throat> in spite of my circumstances, in spite of maybe my temporary discomfort, I'm going to choose to look at what has been given to me, what has enriched my life. I'm going to choose to look out beyond myself, and I'm going to look at what has been given to me from beyond myself. Isn't this kind of what we do with our, with our children? Don't, you, don't we all, haven't we all over the years taught our children, Sally, say thank you because of your birthday present that Uncle Jim gave you. And are we trying to do something to build Uncle Jim's character or affirmation? No. We're trying to build something in little Sally that we know as adults is going to be valuable down the road. Yeah. So we're, as we start in uh, Psalms 107, that's what we're going to find at the very beginning is, is he's calling us, almost like a parent sometimes has to call their kid to attention. Hey, what do you say? What do you say? At, in the way Psalms uh, is written that way, the very <laughs> first verse, is, it's kind of asking the congregation, hey, what do you say? What do you say? Psalms 107 verses uh, 1 and 2 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. That O oh, is kind of an exclamation. Hey, oh, listen, what are you supposed to do? We're supposed to give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is good. And because his mercy that we enjoy every day lasts forever. Now that phrase, oh, give thanks to the Lord, is going to appear five times in just 43 verses. Five times. In fact, the writer will circle back over and over to that particular phrase. Oh, 
that man would give thanks to the Lord. That phrase will appear 30 plus times throughout the book of Psalms. But notice, this, can I call can your attention to the line, oh, give thanks. I think it's easy just to give thanks in general. Oh, sun shining today. I'm so thankful for that. Oh, I got a parking spot. I'm so thankful for that. But the psalmist is connecting it to understanding. He's saying, give thanks to the Lord. It's been said that one of the most disturbing moments in the life of an atheist is when he's standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon or watching a beautiful sunset and there's no one to thank. For the believer, what we do is we give thanks for everything we have, but we don't just give thanks to thin air. We don't give thanks to luck. We don't give thanks to good fortune. We, don't give, th we give thanks to, according to the psalmist, we give thanks to the God of the universe. There's a big difference there. Now, what happens next is there's this connection that, that the psalmist wants to make. So he's trying to remind us through song to be thankful, to recognize the goodness of God in our life. And the way he does it, he's going to take kind of four different vignettes or four different stories, really, very short stories, and he's going to present to us four different people. Uh, and each one of those people find themselves in a place of trouble and in need of something greater than themselves. And, and then they cry out to God, and, and that's what we're going to see. What happens when we get to that place where we, we need someone, we need help, and what is our response in those times? So the first one is for those who have wandered. If you have your passage there, you can read it in verse 2. He says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So he's, again, speaking to a specific group of people, those that have been redeemed by God. He said, let them say so, whom he redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered, those people he redeemed, wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. And here's the turning point in verse 6. So they were found wandering, but here's the turning point. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. So you hear this, man finds himself wandering, God reaches down and says, I'm going to pick you up from your wandering and put you in a place where you belong. And then the psalmist breaks out into this phrase, number two, he says it again, the second time, he says, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works for the children of men. If you're reading an older version, or older translation, it might read like this, that we would give thanks to the Lord for his great mercy, for he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry with goodness. So you hear this, this idea here that God picks us up in our barrenness and our hunger and our wandering and says, I'm going to satisfy your soul. Many of us here on the lawn or watching online this morning, you can relate to that. Yeah, that would describe my life. That would describe my life years ago. That would describe my life maybe weeks ago. Yeah, I was wondering. I, I even encourage you to do that. Just take a minute and, and look on your life. Because if, if you've made it to any significant age at all and you can't recognize a time in your life when maybe you've wandered, you wandered from faith, or you wandered from family, you just wandered from wisdom, you just walked away from good instruction. What did that look like? Have, have, you, have you come back from that? And if you have... Have you given thanks for that? Have you really recognized, man, that, my life was, I might not even, even recognized it, but that hunger and thirst, that could have led to death. I could, I could have been lost. But my God shepherded me. He took the lost sheep and he brings them back into the fold. That wanderer, you know, sheep tend to wander, and so they need a shepherd. They need someone to bring them back to safe places. And, and do, we, do we recognize that of our God, that he... He has great mercy and patience with us. Even when we wander, he'll go and get us and bring us back. I started this morning with saying that God has already done something. I think sometimes in my humanity, I'm like, yeah, you did, but not enough. Hmm. I think that's kind of the attitude you find in our culture today. Uh, I mentioned last week where a mom of a three-year-old toddler made a comment to me that resonated. She said, it seems like the whole world is having a tantrum like a three-year-old. Everybody's just demanding that fix it. Just, I don't know, I don't care how you do it, just, just fix it. And if you don't fix it, I'm going to be angry and shout and yell and, and just stomp my feet and kick my, you know. And, and, and here this, this writer is saying, listen, God has done something. He has stepped in. And remember when you wandered? Remember when you were lost in the woods? He said, he rescued you and brought you in. 
The second one is he, he, he speaks to those who have reaped what they have sown. The book of Galatians is very clear where God framed his universe with the law of sowing and reaping. Mm. Whatever he said you sow, Paul said, you're going to reap. You can sow goodness, you can sow kindness, you can sow faithfulness, and you're going to reap goodness. You're going to reap good things. You're going to reap. He said, if you sow evil, you sow anger and bitterness and rancor, you're going to reap the fruit of that. Whatever you sow, that you shall reap. And so here he says, those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, they were bound in afflictions and irons. Why were they bound in verse 11? Because they rebelled against the words of God and scorned the counsel of the Most High. They despised it. What they were saying is, I don't need God's wisdom. I got this. I got this. I don't need God's wisdom. And it says, therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. And what did they do? They cried out. What happens when you fall down and you're, you're stuck? You call for help. They did the same thing that the wanderer did. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them. Out of their distress, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their chains in pieces. What what does a prisoner want more than broken chains, more than being set free? What does the rebel need? The rebel needs a, a captain to submit to. The wanderer might have just like, ah, oh, you know, I wasn't paying attention, and oh, it was bad on me. I, I kind of got lost. The, the group went that way, and I went this way. That was dumb of me. But the rebel says, the group's going that way. I'm purposefully going that way. I'm, I'm, I'm walking away from this. This is stupid. I can lead better than God. You found yourself in that place before? Again. If you're of any significant age and you haven't had a moment of rebellion or two, I'd like to meet you. You're, you must be pretty amazing. Come tell us how it worked out. Yeah. God's grace, however, reaches down even into our foolishness, even to what we have sown and reaped. And he says, listen, I can even redeem that if you'll cry out. If you cry out, here's again this connection with not just giving thanks to our good luck or our good fortune the way things turned out. But our thanksgiving, our gratitude is connected to a person. And then he cries out in verse 15, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Third time now. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his mercy, for his wonderful works, for he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Mm -hmm. So you hear again this, this, this psalmist just watching humanity go by, watching humanity make decisions, and just his heart goes out, Oh, 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 that you would look up and give thanks. Isn't it amazing, too, these two places that these people have found themselves, the wanderer and the rebel, tend to be the places where we've all found God. And it'll, it'll, that pattern will continue as we go on. We're in, a, we're in a desert place. We're in a dry place. And then we find God. We're, we've hit rock bottom, and we've been thrown in some kind of holding cell. Maybe that's literal prison, or maybe the family has put us to the side, or maybe society has just said, hey, uh, you don't get to play with us anymore. And we've been set in this place. And suddenly, God seems like an option all of a sudden. <laughs> and you know what? God does not despise that. It is a good, C.S. Lewis says, it's a good thing that God is humble or else he would not take us for the reasons that we come to him. Isn't that, isn't that true? You don't have to feel bad that you found God at rock bottom because congratulations, most of us did. And don't wait. Don't be foolish. Don't wait for rock bottom. Don't wait for the wilderness. Don't wait for prison. But if you ha have found God there and you're still too stubborn to cry out, that's, that's who God is sad for. And that brings us to the third one, because now there's like this downward spiral. You know, if you read, you want a little bit of homework for this particular passage, go home later this afternoon or this evening, pick up your Bible and read Romans chapter 1. It's genius. Because what you're going to find in Romans chapter 1 is this, um, this, this um, setting, if you will, this explanation of what has happened to mankind and why they're in need of redemption. And Romans 1 describe a, describes a downward spiral, and that spiral began with ingratitude. Mm. If you read it, it says, they were ungrateful, and when they were ungrateful, their foolish hearts became darkened. It's crazy in our culture today, there's this, this rage against the machine, rage against the man, rage against the, the ethnicities, rage against authority. There's this anger. It's everywhere in our culture today. And it's dark. There's no, there's no like, oh, that, your anger just makes me so hopeful right now that something good's <laughs> going to happen. 
Oh, your anger is just so approachable right now. Just, it just gives me such warmth of my soul. Anger isolates us. And in Romans chapter 1, it says that that anger towards God, that shaking of the fist and said, I will not recognize you. I will not be thankful. It says now that action leads to darkness. It leads to a hardening of the heart and a foolishness of the mind. Read it in Romans chapter 1 when you get home. And so this third part is it says, verse 17, fools, because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Now, this is the person who's gotten to the bottom and still, mm -hmm. still needs a rod, still will not turn, still digs in in their stubbornness. Their soul aboard all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. This particular person now is on the edge. He's on the edge of destruction. And verse 19, and in that moment, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. They cried out, and listen to what it says, and in their trouble, he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word, and he healed them. He delivered them from their destruction. So God just steps in, even to the deepest, even to the darkest places, if that person would cry out. God is there because his grace can go places we never imagined. You only have to have three to have a pattern. We've already got a pattern here, right? Whatever the brokenness of our heart is, whether it's our wandering heart, that sounds like, that'd make a great country music. That's a great idea. Yeah. Or the rebellious heart, or the foolish heart. It doesn't matter. We're all lost. We're all in need of a Savior. We're all sinners. You know, that, that, that is unpopular to say right now. We call that fire and brimstone preaching. Well, we don't do that anymore. We've walked away from that. Well, I'm sorry, we're all sinners. I, I would love that not to be true, but it is. But the good news is that we have a Savior, and if you will, here's the pattern, cry out. <laughs> cry out. Don't be casual about your, your destruction. Don't be casual about being on the edge, on the brink of annihilation. Cry out for help. When I'm really in trouble, I let people know. When I'm really in need of help, I let people know. When little kids, kids are smart about this. When they fall, they want mom and dad to know that they are in pain. They want mom and dad to come and soothe them, to do what they can, to help them. They know, I need help. I know you told me not to go out of the yard, but I went out of the yard, and I went and I hurt myself, and now, help! Don't be casual about the state of your soul, but cry out to the only one who can save you. There's an old hymn of the faith. When I was a brand new uh, believer coming out of lostness in my life, coming out of addictions and and reaping what I'd sown, coming off of the edge of destruction like this psalmist wrote. I remember someone drug me to a church camp. I had no idea what was going to happen. I'd never been to anything like that. I was in my early 20s. And I remember sitting down and waiting for the service, whatever that meant to begin. I had no idea. And I remember a woman alone just walked out onto a stage. And I'll never forget, I was probably 10 rows back, so she was right there in the middle. And she had this instrument in her hand called an auto harp. I don't know if you even know that that's even around anymore, but, right? It was an instrument of the 70s or the 80s, I don't know, maybe. And she just began to play this auto harp, and she began to strum it, and then she began to sing an old hymn. Now, again, I'm not church. I have no church history. I have no Bible history. I was basically a heathen just recently, just snatched, just like this psalm says, just snatched out of, de out of destruction. And she begins to sing, There is a fountain filled with blood, flowing from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And the Spirit of God just began to move over my life. I didn't really even understand the theology behind the words. But this young woman, not a super experienced, not a professional musician, but something in it just moved me. And then this verse, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Washed all my sins away. There go I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Think about that. This is, that, that hymn was written based on a story. A story of a man next to Jesus nailed to a cross. The Bible is clear and tells us who that man was. Does, just actually doesn't give him a name, calls him the thief. A thief on the cross, a thief. 
That thief hadn't been to Sunday school. That thief hadn't, hadn't colored in the drawing. That thief hadn't put money in an offering. That, that thief hadn't raised his hand in worship. That thief had been a thief to the last moment of his life. And he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, significant word, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, go get baptized. Go get your theology right. Go do some good deeds. No. Jesus turns and says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Mm. That's how deep and how wide and how powerful the grace of God is. Even on the brink of destruction, if we would cry out, God comes through and says, you're going to be with me in paradise. He saves the man's life. And then the psalmist cries out one of the last times, verse 21, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And now let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. So he's, he's calling. He's not saying you can earn this. He's saying you respond to it. You can't earn it. You can't do it. The thief was helpless. He had no history to undo. I mean, he had no way to fix his history. He was helpless. And now he says, now rejoice with it. Your job now, your, our job is to rejoice. We come to the fourth, uh, fourth picture that the psalmist gives us. His congregation is the entire nation of Israel, and he, he's describing them one by one in their lostness. But in this last one, he describes uh, those that are just doing life's business. You, I, I would call this guy the captain of industry. Mm. He's in his ship sailing to far shores to buy and to sell, to do business, to make something of himself. I would say that this guy, he, he's an archetype. He's probably not a real person. He's an archetype. But this, this type would probably look down on the previous three. Oh, that wanderer, that rebel, that fool. Not me. I'm the captain of my destiny. You won't see me lost. You won't see me in rebellion. You'll see me at the head of the class. This is what it says. Those who go down to the sea in ships who do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. Here he's describing, he's like, this, there's another man who... He's out doing business, and, and he's doing all right. And he sees the work of God. He recognizes it. Oh, this, this deep ocean that I'm traversing to get to this far-off land, this, this sea, this is the work of God's hands. And you may think in, when you're in a ship that you're in control, but sometimes the weather says otherwise. The winds lift up, and it says the, 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 the waves look like this. They mount up to the heavens. They go down to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and at their wit's end. Doesn't that sound like a man lost at sea? Have you ever been out on the ocean when the waves were really high and your boat goes up and then it goes down and you're staggering to and fro? You might only have a few feet to go. You can barely get there. Now what happens to this man in verse 28? If he's wise, he will then cry out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brings them out of their distress. He calms the storm so its waves are still. And then they are glad because they're quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. Think about that for a moment. What are, what are we in right now? You might have came into this one of four different ways, or maybe another way we haven't even mentioned today. But one way you might have come into the storm that we're in right now is on top of your game. Business owner or the top of, of your profession. But man, this pandemic's kind of reshuffled the deck, hasn't it? It's made everybody rethink, more. can I pay my mortgage this month? Can I? Can I? Well, we started this business because we thought the economy was going this way, but what if it goes this way? And you know what now is a great time to do? Cry out to the Lord. <laughs> oh God, I do not know the future. Uh, if I make my plans without you in them, I am a fool, as much as the wanderer or the rebel. Uh, would, you, would you save me in my distress? And he finishes one more time, the fifth time. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and his mercy, for his wonderful works. It says, let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. As we finish this morning, I want to bring us back to where we started with the little child. Isn't there something you know as a parent when you teach little Sally to say thank you? This isn't about you as an adult needing to hear it. I mean, it's nice to hear it maybe. 
But this is something you know about humanity and about human nature. That in saying thank you, you're teaching little Sally or little Johnny, listen, life is bigger than you. I'm trying to enlarge your life because if I allow you to just to be self-centered, if I allow you just to never be grateful, you will never be satisfied. Your soul will want. Your soul will shrivel. And so what we do as parents is we, we teach our children, listen, you need to say thanks. You need to be grateful because we don't want them to grow with a small soul. We want them to grow with a soul that is full. And so the writer here, there's a few more verses. You can read them later, but he ends with these words. He says, whoever is wise, in verse 43, will think about these things, will observe these things, and they will understand. If you will think about them, they will understand the mercy, the loving kindness of the Lord. I think we see around us again, like we said earlier, is there's a, there's a culture now that is trying to solve her issues, trying to solve all the division, trying to solve all the problems without God. And all you end up with is little raging adults, little raging children trapped in adult bodies. And here the psalmist this morning and we this morning, we call us. As pastors, we call us. If you feel like you've been sucked into this narrow, shriveled spot of anger, this narrow spot of, of self-pity, this, this, this small world of woe, woe is me. Listen, God himself calls us up this morning and says, listen, if you'll just lift your face and your voice and recognize all that I've done. There's a passage in Scripture in the, chap in the Gospel of Luke where ten lepers come to Jesus and they cry out. If you were a leper in those days, your life was over. It didn't matter how old you were. If you were a leper, you were not going to have family. You were not going to have a job. You were not going to get an education. You had no future. You were done. And these ten lepers cry out, Lord, save us. Son of David, have mercy on us. They appeal to God's goodness. And Jesus says, I will Go show yourself to the priests and be clean. And they are clean, just like he says, at the word of his power. And then scripture records that one comes back and falls at Jesus' feet and worships and says, Lord, I am grateful. And Jesus says, weren't there nine others? Hey, wait a minute, just a second. I'm grateful you're here. Hold on a minute. But he looks over this man's shoulder who's kneeling at his feet and says, weren't there nine others that I healed? Where'd they go? And then he turns to this one and says, get up. Your faith has made you whole. Do you hear the connection there? He comes and he kneels down and says, Lord, I'm grateful. He recognizes who healed him. He expresses that gratitude. That Listen, don't miss it here. That feeds his faith. And Jesus says, your faith will keep you whole. Your faith will heal you. That's the progression we're talking about here this morning. These vignettes are just stories of people who wandered, drifted, rebellious, and then God brought them back. And their faith, their gratefulness, made them whole. I just, I urge you this morning, make the connection between your gratitude and the health. The health of your soul, the health of your body, the health of your mind. This is, this is deep enough truth that everyone's started to figure it out. Psychologists will tell you, keep, keep a gratefulness journal, that, that's, which is a great thing to do. Doctors will tell you, hey, have, have, you uh, have you been grateful for what's been done for you? Because it can have an effect on your body. Isn't it funny how timeless truths found in the scripture sometimes get brand new again? I urge you this morning, make the connection. This... This act of communion, if you haven't yet got the elements of communion, you can find them at the tent over there. If you're home, prepare communion. Just prepare communion right now before you. This, this that we do has been done in this form for 2,000 years. Before that, it was a Passover feast. But Jesus reframed it. And he said, you know, there was, there was a time in your history when... Uh, an angel was going to come and wipe out the firstborn. And you were not enough. You were not good enough. When 
the judgment came, you'd be judged just like the Egyptians. Just like the oppressor. You may find, you may think you're in the right, but you're just in the wrong as anyone else. There's blood put over the doorpost of your home that saved you. I'm now. I am now that blood. I am now that sacrificed body. The doorpost isn't your home anymore, it's your heart. And every gospel, every gospel recorded the the same interaction that he had with his disciples. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, this is my body. And with that, that phrase, he reframed the narrative, and he said, you deserve brokenness, but I'm taking it. And then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, and they all drank it. And then he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Before we take this morning, I want to give you an opportunity just to pause for a minute and thank Almighty, Sovereign God for what He's done in your life, right where we started here this morning. Where would you be if God hadn't intervened rescued you when you cried out. We take this bread this morning, Lord, and we take this cup. We thank you. We wake up tomorrow morning and we thank you for our breath and our daily bread. And we wake up the next morning we're still alive and there's still bread and we're still breathing. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We'll take together. As we worship together in this last song, I just urge you to move. Move towards worship with a heart of gratitude.
We thank you, God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. God, we recognize uh, without you, we're dead in our trespasses and sins, without hope and separate from the only one who could save us. But because of your son, we draw near to the throne of grace and we say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you came this morning and you feel like the Father's been speaking to you and your soul is dry or your soul feels like it's in tatters of before you leave here, don't waste a moment. Maybe there's some of our team over there at our prayer tent on your right, and they're going to be here for a few minutes after the service. They'd love, they'd love to just pray with you. I feel like there's people here, you're here this morning, and that word, my soul feels like it's kind of in tatters. Man, let someone just pray for God's grace to be upon you. Let someone agree with you before you leave here. Yeah, if you're watching this stream, and I encourage you, please do the same. If you're in a group at home, then pray together. If you're not, if you're alone in this, please don't be. You don't have to be. Don't do this alone. We would love to talk with you, pray with you, call call the front office. We'd love to get a hold of you. You know, um, crazy times call for crazy methods, and yeah. so we've been out here um, all summer long, uh, 11 or 12 weeks. We're going to stay here as long as we can, like I said. And um, in about uh, in two weeks... September 20th. If you were with us last week, we did a bunch of baptisms, eight or nine baptisms right down here. We're going to pray for babies. <laughs> we're going to do like a mass baby dedication. <laughs> We've had literally dozens of babies born in the last six months. And uh, a lot of them believe in this idea of just praying and blessing, laying our hands on them. So if that's you, you can talk to Courtney over, excuse me, uh, Tessa over there in our tent or go online and we're going to get you registered and get in contact with you over the next few days. So it's the 20th of September right here in both our services. Yeah, that's going to be a great time. Hey, speaking of great times, this Saturday is men's retreat. Men, if you haven't got registered yet, it is not too late, but get registered today. Tennyson's right over there. He can help you do that if you're struggling with the website, but we'll love to walk through that with you. I want to be with all of you guys uh, at men's retreat, so please come there. We're really looking forward to it. The, the theme is worthy. Worthy. And if you're a guy, there's going to be meat. <laughs> so enough said about that. There's going to be meat. Hey, as we finish... Um, as you know, uh, all this stuff has been rented, and many of you may not, but um, when we had to move outside, we rented all this equipment and stage and so forth, and uh, it, it cost us over $1,000 a week to be out here, something that wasn't in our budget, something we didn't plan on, no one planned on COVID, but if you'd like to be a part of helping us maintain that or helping cover that, um, on the way out, there's an usher there with buckets, or if you just want to give in general to the future of this community, um, we would welcome that. You can find that online as well on our website. It's easy to find. Yeah. So the Lord bless you as you go. The Lord keep you. Imagine the Lord's face shining on you like you feel this late summer sun right now. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord show his mercy to you. The Lord rescue you. The Lord guide you and feed you as we enter into this fall season. Yeah. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Give someone a high five, a hug if their work that works, an elbow bump, a fist bump, or just a wave as you go by. It's good to have you with us. We'll see you next week.